questions. Uh, do we have you there, Professor Steve Starr? Um, yes, you do. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, well, I shared my screen here. I have a PowerPoint presentation. I'd like to begin by emphasizing that Russia considers itself at war with the United States and European nations, specifically the UK, since the US and UK have launched their missiles into the territory of Russia. Um, and I, I'll, this was a statement made by President Putin on September 12th when Keir Starmer came to the White House when they were set to initiate this attack, but was delayed until, well, after Trump was elected. So they went ahead and attacked Russia anyway. And the U.S. hides behind the fig leaf that it's they're allowing Ukraine to make these decisions. But as President Putin pointed out, uh, the decisions are made in Washington. The targeting decisions, the programming is all being done by the United States technicians. Uh, and the result was that um, the other day, Russia used its new intermediate range ballistic missile to strike Ukraine. And this is a MIRV warhead, which means it can carry multiple uh, warheads. There looked like there were six different uh, more separate groups of uh, weapons. So, and they, some, look, some people say that there were 36 total projectiles that hit. I don't know. I believe Larry Johnson suggested it could have been six missiles, but at any rate, these are nuclear capable and uh, <laughs> Russia was making the point. So what else has happened? Well, a couple of days ago, uh, it was on Judge Napolitano's uh, broadcast, Colonel McGregor stated that Russia has placed its nuclear forces on full alert. Well, I have uh, at least two sources right now telling me that Russian nuclear rocket forces are on full alert. They are at the highest level of readiness they have ever achieved, which means that uh, they are literally a, a short message away from launching nuclear warheads on missiles against anyone that threatens them, whether it's the United States or it's uh, surrogates in Eastern Europe. So that much has happened, which suggests to me that the Russians have taken this very seriously. Uh, I would think that the United States would make a corresponding uh, increase in its DEFCON status if Russia, if they detect that Russia has done that. So it's very likely that both the United States and Russia have moved to very close to a nuclear war fighting status with their DEFCON. Russia has begun production of mobile nuclear shelters and distributing these. These are protected citizens from various threats, particularly radiation. They can be equipped with air filters. <laughs> um, Russia recently announced, well, the, the spokesperson for the foreign ministry announced that the uh, Aegis Ashore missile base in Poland is now a priority target. Uh, the U.S. also has a similar base in Romania. The Polish base is 741 miles away from Moscow. That's about the distance of Quebec City from Washington, D.C. The Romanian base is 811 miles. That's like Thunder Bay over on the northern edge of Lake Superior for Washington. Uh, I suspect the United States wouldn't appreciate that if they had uh, missile bases placed in those locations. Uh, this, these systems use a MK-41 vertical launch system, and it can be used to launch nuclear-armed Tomahawk cruise missiles. This is a selection of missiles that can be used you know, you can see uh, in the center anti-air warfare, the SM-6 missile, which may eventually be replaced with a hypersonic weapon that can hit Moscow in four to five minutes. I suppose it could be fitted with a nuclear warhead. But you can see over here, the Tomahawk missile is, is uh, one of the weapons that's loaded into the Mark 41. This is an image of the of the missile being loaded into it on a, the agency shores 
Aegis systems are used on naval vessels, so that's why they call it a shore. Well, Russia can't verify what's in those containers. You can see over to the right that the missile goes in the container, and that's the structure. So you can understand why Russia would consider this to be a priority target, because the Tomahawk missile can hit Moscow in about an hour or so, and it's the hypersonic weapons will, that soon to follow will be in a matter of minutes. I think that if, uh, if they're foolish enough to attack the cursed nuclear power plant that could start a nuclear war, Russia would retaliate with a nuclear strike. The nuclear power plant is within range of all the missiles, the Attackum and Storm Shadow Scout missiles, uh, and it has two older nuclear reactors that are not protected by concrete containment. A concerted attack with a swarm of missiles would, could be, you know, even though the Russians have been shooting down the Attackums and Storm Shadows, it doesn't mean that if they get hit with a swarm of them, they'll get every single one. Each of these reactors in the spent fuel pools contains at least 10 times more long-lived radiation than was released by the 1986 Chernobyl disaster. You can see um, this is a comparison. The RBMK Chernobyl-type reactors at Kursk, these are the two there. Uh, but a modern reactor has a cylindrical concrete dome. It's about three feet thick and lined with steel. So they're much more difficult to hit. The, this is an interior view of the Chernobyl II um, reactor and the Kursk reactor on the left is Chernobyl. Uh, that in the back there's, uh, is, is the top of the reactor. That's the top of the reactor and this one. And adjacent to that is the spent fuel pool. So they're right next to each other in a building that doesn't, it's not protected. Uh, this, this is a image that the French nuclear IRSN um, organization created to show the spread of cesium-137 after the Chernobyl reactor blew up in 1986. Uh, these reactors have a graphite core, which will burn. So the line at the bottom down there uh, shows as a progression over a three-week period as the radiation spread throughout Europe. And I mean, it went everywhere. We got some in, in North America too, but uh, uh, the areas around Chernobyl and Belarus were, were really hard hit. Uh, this is a map that and I made in 1996 by the CIA. The darkest red areas are the exclusion zones. They're too radioactive for people to live in. There's still about 1,100 square mile there. Cesium-137 has a 30-year half-life. So um, to get five half-lives, you will get down to about 3%. 10 half-lives, 1%. But uh, you're talking about 200 to 300 years before you can really live in an area like that. So that, that shows you what the you know, implications of uh, hitting these reactors. Well, of course... Uh, the U.S. and Russia can each launch 800 to 1,000 strategic nuclear warheads at each other in a matter of minutes. Another thing they can do, Russia's uh, developed, these, this slide was made by Dr. Postal. They have the Poseidon robot unmanned submarine. It's a drone. It's very large. You can see the image of the man standing above it. And Dr. Postal showed that it can fit a 100 megaton warhead in the, in the, center, in the tip of this. These things can go faster than our torpedoes. They, they have unlimited range. They can loiter. Uh, this is a picture of the Belgorod sub that carries them. You can see the six holes in the front where they would be launched. There are two of these now that are deployed. This is an image of a 100 megaton, well, this is the 50 megaton bomb that was detonated in 1961 by the Russians. I believe these, this photograph was taken at least 75 or 100 miles away from the detonation. was detonated in a uh, remote area where there weren't a lot of forests or anything, but had it been detonated in an area where it was heavily forested or urban, it would have set enormous fires. Dr. Postal created an image of what it would like, if, what it would happen if the Belgorod used six of these torpedoes, these drone submarines to hit the East Coast. And the, the largest yellow circular area depicts the fire zone, would be 17,000 square kilometers or 6,500 square miles for each one of these detonations would be set on fire. Now, uh, this is a uh, video I created some time ago that shows what happens. Uh, this is, I shortened it a little bit, but it shows what happens when Russians uh, respond with an attack on NATO forces, and it goes from there. These are 
counterforce strikes where the U.S. responds and is hitting targets in uh, Russia to take out its nuclear forces, but it's not going to arrive in time for the to do that, and a full-scale nuclear war results. And there'll be more than 4,000 nuclear detonations that incinerate all the major cities in the U.S., Europe. China would probably be involved, too, but the massive nuclear firestorms from these would cover, literally cover hundreds of thousands of square miles. Everything that's flammable in the fire zone would burn. Uh, there would be no survivors. The air temperatures get to above the boiling point of water. So if you live in a city, that would be what you would be looking at. <clears throat> the scientific studies predict that 150 to 180 million tons of soot, smoke and soot would rise into the stratosphere. And in a matter of 10 days to two weeks, the high winds in the stratosphere would spread it around the world. It would cause a global stratospheric smoke layer to form. And this smoke would block about 70% of the sunlight in the northern hemisphere and 35% in the southern. It would also destroy the protective ozone layer. That wouldn't be noticed immediately, but it would after the smoke begins to dissipate. That would be actually about 10 years before it really would go away. Um, so 70% of the sunlight means that it's going to be at, at noon on a day in, in June, say, in the Northern Hemisphere. It would be like having a full moon out at midnight. That's how much sunlight you would get. Uh, Southern Hemisphere would be a little bit less than that, but it would still cause temperatures to be too cold for many years to grow crops. And, you know, the cold weather would cause the death of most humans and land animals. Initially, the daily temperatures would fall below freezing every day for up to three years in Central North America and Central Eurasia. So that's what we're looking at with a nuclear war. Um, Kennedy warned us about this, and this is a little, you know, we're still at a point where we can stop this. Never have the nations of the world had so much to lose or so much to gain. Together we shall save our planet, or together we shall perish in its flames. Save it we can, and save it we must. And then shall we earn the eternal thanks of mankind and, as peacemakers, the eternal blessing of God. Well, Trump may be no Kennedy, but I agree with Scott Ritter that he needs to act, contact the Russians, do everything he can to stop this. I would also suggest that Biden needs to be impeached. And Francis Boyle has written up articles of impeachment that are available. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Starr, for that. And I actually would like to ask, especially given that you're a former UN weapons inspector, Scott Ritter, uh, if you have a response to uh, Professor Steve Starr. Oh, I think you're muted there, my friend. There we go. Okay. There we go. <laughs> Said he, uh, I want to uh, applaud him for laying out the, uh, this, this case, uh, succinctly, uh, accurately, um, dispassionately, almost too dispassionately. It's not a criticism. It's a re reflection of his professionalism, except that, uh, people should uh, be changing their underwear in fear after listening to what he said. And yet I think his soothing voice has calmed us into believing that maybe this was just another um, you know, academic presentation. It wasn't. He was laying out uh, the imminent demise of mankind. Um, and I, I just, I, 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 I want to reinforce that point. Um, you know, the, the Russian weapon that was used, uh, you know, the, the, I'm getting ready to publish a paper on this today, if we make it, um, that, that breaks down what I think it is. There's not much literature out there, but if you know the history of Russian ballistic missile design and, and such, this was a weapon that um, the it, it's related to a weapon that the Russians were developing, the Soviets were developing back in the early 1980s called the Skorost. And the Skorost missile, 15 Ja 66, um, was quickly developed by then uh, Minister of Defense Ustinov to respond to the 
planned deployment of Pershing II missiles by the United States into Germany. The Russians were very afraid of the Pershing II because once you launch the Pershing II, seven minutes later, it hit Moscow. And uh, the Russians were not happy about that. So they built this missile, the Skorost, which was an amalgam of components drawn from the SS-20 Pioneer, the Mod 3 version of the Pioneer, the SS-25, which was still under development, the SS-27, which was top secret under development, nobody even knew it existed. Um, and they put it all together in a two-stage missile uh, uh, topped with um, conventional warheads, and they were going to flood Czechoslovakia and East Germany with these systems uh, and monitor on a continuous basis uh, the Pershing II uh, bases. In the moment